Can you imagine living as a gay samurai during pre-modern Japan? We all know as a country, Japan is usually represented with good food, amazing technology, anime, and of course, samurais. During the early days, samurai were required to follow very strict rules that were heavenly influenced by Confucianism. Because of this, these warriors were expected to stay loyal to one master, respect their superiors, and uphold an ethical life, which is why anything that is out of the ordinary is a no-no. How about a gay samurai? Do they even exist? Well, records show that they do. In fact, it was pretty common during pre-modern Japan for aristocrats and male samurais to favor male lovers. However, it doesn't mean their lives were easy. Just like any homosexual existence, gay samurai had to face discrimination, criticism, and sometimes death. Today, I will bring you back to the time before the land of the rising sun established itself on the pedestal of one of the most progressive countries today. So how did the samurais follow the way of the warrior? And at what cost were they willing to give to love another man? Welcome to Crazy Histories, where we bring you the craziest and weirdest facts from human history. Some of the things discussed in this video may be offensive or disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The Way of the Warrior Bushido, literally translated as the way of the warrior, is the core of how samurais should live their lives. Within it are virtues such as frugality, righteousness, courage, benevolence, respect, sincerity, honor, loyalty, and self-control. However, this code has nothing to do with religion. While it's true that it's heavily influenced by Confucianism, a lot of samurai believe that they are not guaranteed a place in heaven just because they follow it religiously. In fact, they accepted the reality and consequences of the blood on their swords. At most, Bushido is a moral compass. In pre-modern Japan, samurai were expected to fear nothing even death. Their fear should only arise from dishonor and betrayal, and once this happens, there is no other way other than to commit seppuku. This ritual is basically suicide in order to save their face and an attempt to bring back as much honor to their name. If we consider how strict and important following Bushido is, I think it's safe to say that when you think of samurai, Nothing remotely related to homosexuality will come to mind. In fact, you will not even imagine the possibility of a relationship between two samurai during that time. Surprisingly, historians reveal that it was common, but as expected, very controversial. While it's widespread, not everyone is accepting of it. And most of the time, these samurai had to face obstacles because of the code they needed to follow and the dignity they needed to uphold. Homosexual Samurais As mentioned before, it was pretty common for two samurai to be in a relationship. Unlike today, Japan was more accepting when it came to homosexual relationships. Pre-modern Japan normalized aristocrats who engaged in sexual intercourse with a person of the same sex. This was because male figures view the biological aspect of their desire less than its objective nature, which often focuses on passion and beauty. It's also important to know that sexual acts were not associated with sexual identity. This link was only created recently, but in pre-modern Japan, such a connection did not exist. This explains why homosexual relationships among nobles and samurai were widespread. And while samurai marry women, their sexual activities with their wives are more often than not a duty than anything else. Because of this, it was normal for samurai to find comfort in younger males. This relationship is rooted in the practice of shudo. This practice is a tradition where older samurai take in younger samurai as disciples. And since this practice was highly encouraged to pass on to the younger generation the virtue of being a samurai, it basically became a gateway for homosexual relationships between two warriors to blossom. 
Such practice was also greatly influenced by the Chinese, and records reveal that there's a high chance that Shuro originated from the Chinese practice called Nanshoku. It's similar to Shuro, the only difference is that in the latter, the relationship includes two monks. In Nanshoku, a younger monk, who is called a Shigo, would take the ninjas or the older monks' tutelage. Once the Shigo became old enough, the Nanshoku relationship would cease, and the ninja would then be free to seek out another disciple. However, both practices started to bleed into the middle class. There was even a time when Shudo and Nanshuko weren't only exclusive to the samurai, but became the norm for the general population. This happened after a big part of the samurai class was stripped of their swords and ordered to move back to the cities by the Tokugawa shogunate. By 1700 AD, the interaction between samurai and common people had doubled, and it was only natural that the former started rubbing off more of their practices on the masses. However, due to the high influx of people, there was a shortage of labor, and the wealthy took advantage of this. This was the time when male prostitution was at its peak. So what does this mean? Simply, it means that everyone, including warriors, could quickly pay for either heterosexual or homosexual intercourse if they so desired. You see, it became problematic to train apprentices or shudo after the war. Additionally, the samurai class became impoverished as the middle class expanded and their shigo became yet another mouth to feed, which greatly affected their class. Soon enough, samurais were affected and their place in society was no more. Yokio Mishima and Seppuku. You might be wondering why we are talking about Yokio Mishima. Well, when it comes to homosexuality, seppuku, and samurai, this man is worth mentioning. And while his death was as tragic as it might get, the writing he left behind left a greater impact than his death. Yokio was born in Shinjuku on January 14, 1925, he spent his childhood with his grandmother, who raised him in a very orthodox manner. She was also very inclined to violence, and as a resort, she made sure to isolate the young Yukio from his peers. This meant Yukio spent more time with his female cousins and was taught traditional feminine tasks by his grandpa. However, when he reached the age of 12, he was sent back to his parents and was raised in the totally opposite way. His father made sure to erase anything that was feminine and force Yokio to learn more masculine tasks. Just imagine the emotional toll it took. Despite his dysfunctional family, Yokio became a great writer and even received prizes for his literary works. If you could go over some of his works, you would realize how he was inclined toward topics that discussed sexuality. Records also revealed that Yukio must have been gay, and despite being married and having children, a lot of historians and researchers are convinced that Yukio was not straight and can be identified as bisexual at most. Other than his works, Yukio was also known as an avid samurai fanatic. His obsession with the way samurai lived includes his fascination with the ritual of seppuku. This fascination soon grew into a movement. At first, his writing about such things was harmless, but then more like-minded people joined him, and he started to create a political group of his own. On November 25, 1970, Yukio and four others made their way to the Eastern Command Headquarters of the Japan Self-Defense Forces and barricaded themselves in the Commandant's office. After successfully entering the office, Yukio addressed the soldiers from the balcony in an effort to persuade them to stage a coup, and he gave them a manifesto calling for the emperor's return to power. He even threatened them that he would commit seppuku if his conditions were not followed. As expected, the Japanese forces were not convinced of his proposal, and Yukio died as promised. His actions baffled a lot of people, but if we connect the dots, we'll eventually understand the possible reason behind them. 
Remember when I mentioned how fascinated Yukio was with the samurai lifestyle? Now let's go over this quote by Yukio himself, which says, On seppuku, dying for a great cause was considered the most glorious, heroic, or brilliant way of dying. In the end, he wanted his death to mean something. Just like samurais in the pre-modern era, they will only commit seppuku in order to bring back their glory and dignity. The same can be applied to samurai who found themselves in a homosexual relationship. While there was no law that banned such relationships in the beginning, laws that criminalized sodomy and relationships between people of the same sex slowly took over after Christianity was introduced in the country. The shift of power also played a big part. When the Meiji era started, more foreign influences entered the picture, and once Japan fully opened its borders, news about the abundance of male-to-male -male relationships in the country became the headline. Soon enough, people from other countries started condemning the nature of such relationships, and it didn't take long before the Japanese ruling elites were left with no choice but to declare homosexuality unnatural. Because of these, Nanshuko became rapidly unpopular. Some even view the once dignified practice as a psychological disorder. Such things happen because outside influence started shaping the way Japanese people think. And in just a blink of an eye, a country that once accepted the possibility that people of the same gender could connect and love, changed and became discriminative of their own virtues and practices, so that even the samurai, the noblest warriors of their time, could not win the battle of criticism and discrimination. That's it for today's video. Make sure to leave a comment below and let us know what you think. Also, give this video a like and turn on the notifications for more content. See you on the next one.